It is difficult to describe the game simply in terms of a rule set or conditions for play, as they themselves do not provide any insight at all to the complexities involved. In fact, the rules themselves are of such simplicity that they tend to understate its capabilities. The basic conditions are simple. The players face each other with a playing field between them. The playing pieces are littered about the board. The pieces themselves are random objects, being anything from a stapler to a pencil or a book. The game starts with the announcement to one player that it is their move. No further information is produced, nor any cues as to how to perform, nor when the game will end. The results from this initial setup can be quite startling. Some games have lasted as long as an hour, and the players always know when they have won or lost. A non-verbal dialogue exists between the players. It is a pure communication of ideas through the moves of the game. A belief system is applied and interpreted into the abstraction of the apparent chaos of the playing field. But with each move, the new composition of pieces alters both systems working in tandem, and the next player is forced to renegotiate their own translation of the rule system they are implementing. The game's dynamic quality presents a motion of constant flux, bringing forth very quickly further exploration as one uses the previous alteration of the playing field as a springboard for a deeper association of composition. An audience reaction produces further systems into play. This all brings to mind the compositional association systems of Pablo Picasso's Bean Game and Herman Hesse's final work, The Glass Bead Game. What is learned here? What is clear is that we operate in a continual need to abstract the complex, and we come equipped with a matrix of icons both cultural and social. A collective memory of universal coding of symbols and icons we are all linked to that in turn informs a mode of behavior or aspect of performance. Ritual and form dictates atmosphere and behavior. One may not understand the Chinese tea ceremony, but one will know how to behave when in its presence. The power in architecture, then, is its ability to energize a space through this connection, that which gives the space its presence. The North American world is one that has begun to accept conditions of complete alienation as the norm. We are existing more and more separate from each other. The trend is to produce a regimen that reduces life to a bipolar existence of work and home. Home, once considered a place of independence, becomes instead a place of alienation. Communities which we once based upon the daily world one lives in and its proximity are now a result of choice towards specific groups of common interest. There is no tie to one's space. Space being defined by event lacks an ability to leave traces, and with that, a space is left without its sense of place. A world that is spreading more and more to encompass more and more of the world is in fact leaving us with a tighter and tighter scope of personal experience. We seek replacements for our loss. Technology presents itself as the form for closer connection. But if used with such a power over nature, it inevitably leaves an objective gaze upon it. Architecture is reduced to being a carrier, a shell, or holding device. Technology is failing as being a vehicle to restore the social dynamic. Temporal experience is collapsed and linear, leaving a fragmentation of life. So where does architecture stand in the technological world? It is my argument that architecture has its power as a reaction against this form of discourse. Architecture, in effect, should not be looked upon as a container for the tech, but rather the instance of the real, full sensory experience. Architecture has the power to produce lived time, where the measurement is memory and soul. Architecture becomes a celebration of the real. I'm not interested in finding a replacement. I am more interested in reclaiming what has been lost, and what has been lost. We have lost the centers for informal public life, and during the time of our losing, we have also forgotten the ability to create it. I consider that the public form of architecture must begin to ignore the monumental. It does not have to feel pressure to become celebrity, that success is measured by its ability to produce the mark on the world, the signature building, the desire for the heroic. Maybe one should look to making an architecture of the banal, 
I'm suggesting an architecture that speaks not for, but close by. It is responsive to the diversity of the community. But here we must define community. I'm speaking of a community that is based upon proximity and the collection of day-to-day -day experience. And this community needs its place apart from the work and home. It needs its third place, a term first suggested by Gary Oldenburg. The third place is the site of social regeneration. It is the neutral ground where the community meets and connects and defines itself. For this thesis, the public bar is the community's third place. My own personal exploration of the third place focused upon dialogue in all its forms. Dialogue is what gives life to any bar. It is that constant dynamic interaction that relieves the space from the need to assign program. Events are not assigned to spaces. Spaces simply set up the arena for what the community decides is to happen there. The interaction of individuals is the action of the bar, and the bar demands this interaction. Furthermore, the strength of the bar is its ability to produce passion. People need not be polite in a bar. They can be rough and loud and angry. They can be passionate. Passion brings debate. Passion brings dialogue. And most importantly, it brings motion. And motion is what gives the bar its potential. Dialogue as being the main generator for the event of the bar is also in turn the generator for the design. Dialogue in this case includes the verbal realm as well as crowd forms, cerebral, and physical body motion. The social form will produce patterns, and architecture can in turn reflect these and inform upon these patterns. It must be stressed at this point that I am in no way pointing towards some sort of pattern language, at least not one intent upon a system that dictates performance. Consider instead that it is establishing an evocation of a presence. One must set up a framework that suggests to the inhabitant, almost on a subconscious level, of a mode of play, an atmosphere. And all of this is accomplished through a manifestation of the collective memory. So basically, this space is considered an interior landscape, separated not by program, but by specific conditions of behavior. These spaces are fluid not etched in a Cartesian grid. They must blend into one another. The relationships to each other are gradients of voyeuristic and exhibitionistic activity. For although this is talking about a potentially visual relationship, its main event source is dialogue. I spoke before of an architecture of the banal, and I speak of this in all seriousness. The architecture that allows the strength of a community to exist must humbly sit side by side with that community. An architecture that speaks not for, but close by. It is without a connection to the commercial or the packaged. It can be proudly unassuming. It can even be plain. It does not seek to be extraordinary and does not force meaning upon the inhabitant, but allows the meaning to be placed upon it. It is sensual, for it considers space as it is experienced as a combination of all of the senses. I have found over the course of this thesis that I am not alone in my convictions. A school of thought among certain architects, such as Steve Harris and Deborah Burke, calls for the need of an architecture of the everyday. The sociologist Ray Oldenburg demands a return of the third place to our communities. I leave you with these words that I feel echo my own sentiments. The third place is largely a world of its own making, fashioned by talk and quite independent of the institutional order of the larger society. The third place emerges out of the collective ability of that assembly to create it. It is the only kind of public building used by large numbers of ordinary people when their thoughts and actions are not being in some way arranged for them. The consideration of everyday life as a critical political construct represents an attempt to suggest an architecture resistant to this commodification consumption paradigm. A critical theory of normative architecture depends upon strategies neither heroic nor nostalgic, but incremental, subtle, and persistent.